Alhamdulillah, this subject is uh, a very important subject and it's the subject of the Rijal Allah. And the first thing I want to say about the Rijal Allah is that uh, traditionally Rijal Allah was not limited to the masculine gender. Uh, Rijal Allah was actually a, considered a maqam or a station. And Abu Hayyan al-Tawheedi radiallahu anhu in his tafsir of Bahr al-Muhiyyat uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضر الله بعضهم على بعض that رجال are maintainers of nisa, of women because of the preference of Allah for some over others and Allah uses an ambiguous way of uh, articulating preference of some over others and Abu Tahiyan al Tawheedi says about that ayah that first of all not everyone with a beard is considered a rajul that uh, by the mere fact that you have testosterone does not make you a rajul and uh, he clarifies that further by saying that Allah gives and this is called tambihul kitab in tafsir when Allah explains why something is something so when Allah says, Arijal qawwamun ala nisa, He says, Bima. And the ba there is to indicate the cause. Bima faddar Allahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. Because of what Allah has preferred some over others. And that ambiguity indicates that some women have preference over men also. Now he says about that that the preference is in jihad, Amr bin Ma'roof, Nahi an al Munkar. Al-Qiyam Those people who study and learn knowledge That that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is a preference of the rijal Is because they fight jihad fi sabirillah They struggle in the way of Allah with their lives and their wealth They command to good and they forbid evil And because of what they spend out from their wealth Now if that uh, if those criteria do not exist, then there's no uh, qiyam, there's no fadl, there's no preference. If those criteria do not exist, in fact quite the opposite happens. The woman in the house who is raising a uh, child or children and maintaining the house is in the station of a mujahida according to the Prophet ﷺ. So if the woman is doing her jihad and the man is not doing his jihad, then she is preferred over the man quite clearly. And like the poet said, لو كانت النساء كما ذكرنا للفضل النساء على الرجال If all of the women were like the one we mentioned, and he was talking about a great woman, then women would have clearly been preferred over men. So the preference is not a, a biological preference. It is a preference of action and behavior. And this is why many of the ulama used to say about women, and very fascinating thing about women, most of the women that excelled in Islamic sciences excelled in the science of hadith. And it is a recorded fact that there has never been a wadda'a, a woman who falsely placed hadith in the whole history of uh, the Islamic science of hadith, where there have been countless numbers of men who have falsely placed hadith. And so this is one of the things that Allah says about the women, is that they're hafidhat uh, lil ghaib, that they preserve the unseen. That this is something that Allah has given uh, these righteous women. Uh, and this is something very fascinating. So if you look uh, at this idea of the rijal, those people who uh, establish the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in the Quran, Min al mu'minina rijal. From amongst the mu'mineen are, are rijal. And I don't want to translate it as men because I think it becomes misleading. Min and mu'minina rijal. From amongst the mu'mineen are rijal. If you look at the Arabic word rajul, it means to stand on one's two feet. Rajala means to stand on one's two feet. In other words, it is somebody who is in a station of Adamic nature. They are the khalifa in the ard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the maqam of the rajul. And it is not dhakar. It's not a male because Allah distinguishes between the kur and the rijal. Very clearly in the Quran, there is a distinction between males and between rijal. And so the idea of the rijal Allah as models of success, as models of success. 
First thing we have to look at when we think about vocabulary that's important, we want to look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses those words. If you look at the word success in Arabic, you'll probably find two, maybe three words that fit the word. And the first one is tawfiq. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ My success is only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the idea of success is success by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tawfiq is when your actions are in harmony with the mashia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the providence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When one's actions become harmonized with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, this is tawfiq and this is success. And there's no success out of that. If you're not successful, then in English you're called a loser. And in the Quran you're also called a loser, only they're called khasirun. Ula'ika hum al khasirun. They're the losers. They are the losers. And if you want to know the best definition of the losers, then you look in Surah Al-Kahf. Because Allah says, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا Should we tell you who the greatest losers are? الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Those who have completely lost all of their endeavors in pursuit of the dunya. In pursuit of the dunya. وَهُمْ يَحْسِبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يَحْسُونَ صُنْعًا And they think what they're manufacturing, what they're doing, what they're making is this good thing, it's a great thing. Those are the losers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ They are the ones who have been in great towards their signs of their Lord, وَلِقَائِهِ And they didn't think that they were going to meet their Lord. فَحَبِطَتْ أَعْمَادُهُمْ So they lost all of their actions, all of their worldly pursuits were lost. فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا We give them no weight on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. We give them no weight on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the Prophet ﷺ says that there will be huge fat people that come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah who were in this world, they were arrogant and proud and rich and wealthy and people look up to them. And he said they won't weigh even a gnat's wing on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. They have no wazan with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And when Ibn Mas'ud, who was a very thin man, was climbing a palm tree and some of the Sahaba saw his legs, they, they laughed at the, the, the legs were so scrawny that they laughed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Beware about laughing at this man's skinny legs. Because wallahi, on the Yawm Qiyamah, those legs would outweigh the mountain of, of Uhud. You see. So this is, this is the qiyas, this is the criterion of the believers. Our criterion of success is not the criterion of the kuffar. We have a very different criterion of success. But the interesting thing about success by its nature is that success in the dunya and success in the akhirah have very similar qualities and attributes. People that are successful in the dunya, very clear things can be identified amongst those people that will indicate how they became successful in the dunya. And the same goes for the people of akhirah. And so what I would like to do is first, Look at the idea of failure because by opposites things are known. And so if you understand failure, then you'll understand success also. In the Quran, the word fashil, which is failure, there are four uh, verses in which fashil or failure is mentioned in the Quran. And we should look at these verses deeply and consider what they mean because if you want to understand failure, then look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about failure and how failure comes about. The first one is, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَعَصَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَرَاكُمْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Allah was truthful when you had failed. And Allah is talking about Uhud, because if you want to understand failure, then all you need to do is study the ghazwat of Uhud, which is why so many verses in the Quran were given to the analyses of what happened on the day of Uhud, in which the mu'mineen were better prepared than they were prepared on Badr, and yet the, the Uhud was, did not have the same outcome as it had as Badr. Allah says, when you had failed, وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Now, in the Qur'an, Allah will sometimes put what should come first, second. This is very common in the Arabic language. Failure is related to tanazu' And tanazu' has to do with when you dispute it amongst yourselves. Because the Prophet commanded a group of archers to maintain on this small mountain overlooking Uhud to protect the believers. And when they saw the the goods being distributed and they thought there was clear victory, this, a group of them left and the leader that the Prophet ﷺ had put in charge told them don't leave, 
and only a small group remained with him and the other ones left and they disobeyed that the Prophet ﷺ had put in to charge. And this caused the failure when Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl and Khalid ibn Walid took advantage of this situation and they attacked the believers before they had become Muslim and they caused a great uh, tragedy amongst the believers and uh, we lost uh, shuhada which were gained with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liyattakhida minkum shuhada Allah took back to them shuhada and so it was a victory in the end because the Prophet said qatraakum fil nar wa qatrana fil jannah your dead are in the fire and our dead are in paradise walhamdulillah but Allah wants to explain to us wa asaytum min ba'di ma araakum ma tuhibbun and you disobeyed so you had tanazu' and you had isyan so if you want to understand failure the it's very clear. Disobedience to Allah and His Messenger and uh, disputation amongst yourselves. No people goes astray after they had guidance except they're given disputation amongst themselves. And so disputation amongst each other is a sign of failure. And this doesn't mean that we can't disagree and, 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 and look for... No, disagreement is important. Ikhtidafu hadid ummah is rahmah. The differences amongst this ummah is mercy, but the differences has to be based on knowledge. It can't be based on empty opinions. It has to be based on what Allah and His Messenger say, and not on what we think and what my opinion is. And in my humble, and, uh, humble opinion, there's no such thing. If you're seeing your opinion as being humble, you're already in a state of arrogance. I mean, quite literally. Uh, Ibn Atayla says, the one who sees his humility has lost humility. So we, and a lot of people say it, and they don't think about it, just because it's something that Kufar like to say, in my humble estimation. You won't see that in any of the salaf, say, fi ra'i al Because first of all, opinion is something, Imam al-Shafi'i said, knowledge is qala Allah wa qala Rasulullah wa ma siwahuma wa sawisa shayateen. Knowledge is what Allah said, what His Messenger said, and other than that is whisperings of shayateen. And one of the signs of the end of time is i'jabu kulli bi The, uh, the uh, amazement of every opinionated person with his opinion. The, then Allah says, from amongst you are those who want the dunya, and from amongst you are those who want akhirah. Now, I prefer the opinion of the Maliki scholar from Alexandria ibn Atayullah who said, don't think that Allah is saying they wanted dunya for its own sake. Those were the Sahab of the Messenger of Allah and the best of creation who were defending the Prophet of Allah on that day of Uhud. They wanted dunya for akhirah. But their desire for that dunya for akhirah, there were those who wanted dunya so, solely for the akhirah, and there were others that didn't even care about dunya, they only wanted akhirah without any looking to the dunya. And this is a good makhraj for the sahaba radiallahu anhum. So Allah says, from amongst you are those who want dunya, and from amongst you are those who want akhirah. For us, unfortunately, it doesn't have that beautiful makhraj. Because there are those who want dunya, and those people will destroy the ranks of the Muslims. And the, one of the sahaba who, they heard the cow, call to the Muslims about the Majusi in the Ghaba. When Muawiyah heard that story, he had somebody from the army come and he said, what was the secret of that day? And he said, I think the secret of that army is I don't think we had one person in that entire army that wanted dunya. The next ayah, Allah said, إِذْ هَمَّ الطَّائِفَتَانِ أَن تَفْشَلَى وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّهُمَا وَعَرَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكِّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ If two groups of you began to get anxious thinking that you would fail and this is the hum of shaitan shaitan puts anxiety in them يَعِدُكُمْ الْفَقَرِ he promises you failure, poverty and penury and these things and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says هَمَّ الطَّائِفَتَانِ two groups and again this is in the ghazwa when the Prophet sallallahu they saw the numbers of the Muslims and a group of them wanted to leave like the munafiqoon two groups but Allah gave them strength because Allah reminded them وَلِيُّهُمْ Allah. how can you think that you will fail when your protector is Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ إِذْ جَمْعَ النَّاسِ لَهُمْ وَقَالُوا اَخْشَوْهُمْ فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ When the groups uh, gathered together saying, Oh look, they're going to uh, conquer you. It increased them in Iman and they said, We trust in Allah and Allah is enough as a protector. And so this is the Iman. And Allah says, So let the believers trust in Allah. And then look at this reminder immediately after that. وَلَقَدْ نَصُرُكُمَ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّهِ And this is one of the essential elements of success is to remember past successes. And so Allah reminds them, He gave you victory on the day of Badr and you were weak. 
You were weaker than you were today, so why do you think you should fail today if he gave you victory on Badr when everything indicated that you would lose that day and it became Badr al-Kubra, the great battle of Badr, because we had victory. And then the next ayah, so these are the first two ayahs, the third ayah, إِذْ يُرِيكَهُمَ اللَّهُ فِي مَنَامِكَ قَلِيلًا he shows you in your dream, and the Prophet's dream is revelation, that they were few in number, the kuffar, that you would defeat them. And this is instilling in the heart, the recognizing that no matter, despite their great numbers, they're still few because they don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And despite our little numbers, we are great because we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is when Allah reminds us in the Quran, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلًا غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرًا How? بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that victory is by the idhan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not by superiority in technology, in hardware, in numbers, in any of these things. This is all illusion. It's waham from shaitan. And shaitan wants to make us think that we are weak and we can't overcome and we don't have strength and power. And the great mujahid, uh, Khalid ibn Walid, on that day when they met the Romans and they were like spread out locusts, and the Sahaba and the Tabi'een began to fear some fear when they were looking out at the vast numbers and they were small in number. And Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu reminded them, he said, حَوْقَلُوا يَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ Say, لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ يَا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ There is no power and no strength save in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be deluded by these armies in front of you because Allah is the giver of power, Allah is the giver of victory, and Allah is the one who will give success to the mu'mineen. And the hearts became tranquil ala tatma'innu al dhikrillah the hearts become tranquil by the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then in the last I and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says walaw araqahum kathira la fashiltum wa tanaza'tum fil amri walakin Allah sallam innahu alimun bidhat as-sudur if Allah had showed you that they were great if he made you think in your hearts that they were great you would have lost you would have disputed amongst yourselves but Allah knew what's the secrets of the hearts he knows how to yuthabbit alladheena amanu bil qawl thabit he will give tathbit for the people who believe with the strong and firm word of la ilaha illallah they all of that is false gods from other than Allah every power other than Allah is a false god and don't believe in it believe even the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah said, then you would dispute amongst yourselves and you, that would cause you to lose. And so Allah says, but Allah is the one that sallam, that He's the one that gives safety, that He's the one that gives peace, that He's the one that will give strength. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He knows the inner hearts. And then He says in the fourth ayah, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا do and obey Allah and obey His Messenger and do not dispute amongst one another. At-tanazu'ah. Don't dispute amongst one another because you will lose. hukum And your power, your wind which pushes the sails of Islam. And the sail, the word for sail in Arabic is shira' which is the same root from sharia. That the sharia is powered by the, the wind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Birih from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the quwa that Allah gives us to move this deen forward to the next generation and to establish it in the earth. Allah says, if you dispute amongst yourselves, if you do not obey Allah and His Messenger, then you will lose. You will lose and your power and your strength will go. Wasbiru. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ So be patient, because Allah is with those who are patient. So in these four ayahs, you have the essence of failure. The essence of failure is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disobeying His Messenger, and disputation amongst yourselves out of ignorance and arrogance. And the strength is clearly identified in the final ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Obey Allah and His Messenger, and don't dispute amongst yourselves. And if you do that, you will have victory. Now, the next thing I want to look at is just a few models of success in this ummah. And the first model that I want to use is Suhaib al-Rumi. And there are many Sahab I can choose from any of them because they're all models of success. Suhaib al-Rumi, the reason I choose to take him is first of all, he was a slave who was stolen in his youth by Byzantines. He was raised amongst the Byzantines and finally escaped from them and ended up in Mecca poor and bereft. But the man was a man of success. He became a wealthy merchant in Mecca very quickly. When the Sahaba were making hijrah, Suhaib al-Rumi made hijrah alone. He thought he was going to make hijrah with the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet made hijrah with Abu Bakr. He made his hijrah alone. The Quraysh followed him out. 
And he finally set his arrows and he saw the Quraysh in front of him and he said, Ya Quraysh, innakum ta'lamuna inni ara inni armakum. You know that I'm one of the best archers amongst you. And in wallahi, if you come near to me, I'll throw every arrow at you and take many of you and I'll kill many of you. But if you let me go, then I'll tell you where I hid my wealth in uh, Mecca and you can go and take it. And they agreed with that and they were people, even though they were mushrikeen, they were people of wafa and not of ghadab. And so they gave him his aman and then they went back and they took his wealth. When he got to Medina, the first thing the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Rabbi had tijara tuka ya Aba Yahya. Your tijara with Allah is it that was successful. Your tijara with Allah was successful. Rabbi had tijara tuka ya Aba Yahya. You traded dunya for akhirah, and that is what gave you your success. Rabbi had tijara tuka ya Aba Yahya. Rabbi had tijara tuka ya Aba Yahya. Who told him, Man baaka? Who told you what the Suhaib al Rumi did in the middle of the desert? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the gift of Suhaib al Rumi to this ummah. Min al nas, from those who sell themselves, seeking only the desire of Allah, seeking only the contentment of Allah. The next uh, successful model I want to use is a black woman who we don't even know her name, who used to sweep the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when she died, this woman who the Sahaba uh, prayed over and didn't, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not informed. When he saw that she wasn't in the masjid anymore, he said, where's that old black woman? And they said, she died, Ya Rasulullah. He said, why didn't you tell me so I could pray over her? This is a woman whose uh, na name is not even mentioned in the, in the books. We just know she was a black woman who used to sweep the masjid. And she was successful because the Prophet noticed her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala noticed her. And another one is Zuhair, who was a simple Bedouin who used to come to Medina and he used to sell things in the souk. And one day Jibreel came and said, should I show you someone who Allah loves and you should love? And he said, yes. And he took him out and he showed him this poor Bedouin Zuhair. And he said, yeah, Zuhair. He came up from behind him and he covered his eyes. And Zuhair smelt the scent of the Prophet on his palms. And he said, man yashtari hadha al-abd. The Prophet said, who will buy this slave? And Suhair said, إِذَنْ تَرَعْنِي كَاسِدًا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Then you see me that I'm somebody that's not moving in the market. I'm not worth anything. And the Prophet said, أَنْتَ لَأَسْتَ بِكَاسِدَ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ You're not worthless in the eyes of Allah. And he used to say to this man, أَنْتَ بَادِيَتُنَا وَنَحْنُ حَاضِرُكُمْ You are our desert and we are your city. And so this is another man who was successful in this life and in the next life. A simple merchant that sold simple things from the desert on the streets of Medina. And then the next person I want to look at is somebody who was a, uh, an African, uh, a black African man whose name is Saeed ibn Jubair. Radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest of the tabi'een. This was a man who grew up with a love of knowledge that attached him to the greatest of the Sahaba. He was a student of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He was a student of uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He was a student of Abu Huraira. And finally, he became one of the greatest students of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. This man who was a teacher of men and a, a, a maker of rijal. And he became one of the greatest of the tabi'een and one of the most learned people of this ummah. When he died, it was said about him, with him, knowledge has gone into the earth that every single living creature in this world is in need of. With this man's death, knowledge has gone into the earth that will not be returned. This man who during the time, the great fitna of Hajjad ibn Yusuf, when he killed Abdullah ibn Zubair at the Kaaba, who was the Khalifa of that time, when he killed that man, and then each person he would take in front of them and he say, did you make kufr by your breaking the bay'ah, by your breaking allegiance with Bani Umayyah? And the people, if they said no, he would have them killed. And if they said yes, then he would let them go. And many people said no. And this man, Saeed ibn Jubair, who heard about this fitna, he knew one day he would meet Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And so he went to a, a, a small village near Mecca and for 10 years he taught people. For 10 years, people of Mecca would go and learn from this man. And Hajjaj, when his governor found about the power and the authority that this man had amongst the people, he sent his armies to get this man. And his armies came, and when they took him from his house, his daughter uh, began to weep. And she said, his daughter began to weep, and she said, and he said, Liqa'una fil jannah. 
Our meeting is in Jannah. So he knew where he was going. وَأَعْضَمُ جِهَادٍ كَرِمَةَ الْحَقَّ مَعْمْ سُلْطَانٍ جَائِرٍ And the greatest jihad is to speak the truth in front of an unjust tyrant and then be killed for it. And this is the ahad which uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair had. And so he was brought forth in front of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And he said, مَنَ أَنْتَ And he said, Sa'id ibn Jubair. And he said, بَلْ أَنْتَ شَقِي ibn Iksir. You're the shaqi because Sa'id is felicitous. He said, you're the wretched, the son of the broken. Jubair is the one that fixes. And he said, my mother knew what my name meant more than you did. And then he asked him a series of questions. And in the end, he told him, how do you want to be killed? And he said, you have no power to do anything to me. Just do what you want. And so, and he told him, I will be the last person that you kill. When he left, uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair began to laugh and he had him brought in and he said, what are you laughing about? He said, I'm laughing at your arrogance before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How stupid you are, what a fool you are to think that you are some kind of tyrant in the earth that can do what he wants and you won't. And he said, Wallahi, you're the, I'm the last person that you are going to kill. And Hajjaj ibn Yusuf said to him, I've killed better than you. And he said, exactly, those people forgave you. I'm not going to forgive you. And I'm making dua against you and Allah will take you. The, uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, after he was killed, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf lived 15 days. Every night he would see in his dreams Sa'id ibn Jubair pulling at his feet or grabbing his neck and he would shout out, Mali was Sa'id ibn Jubair. Mali was Sa'id ibn Jubair. This is the power of the wali of Allah. You see, this is the power of the wali of Allah. This is the power of successful people. And then the next person I want to look at is Sahnun, the great Qadi of Tunis of al Qayrawan. And this is a man who lived his life in, in, in poverty and humility and became one of the greatest scholars of this Ummah. The Ibrahim ibn al-Aghlab, who was one of the greatest rulers that this Ummah has seen, who was a scholar and a hafiz of Qur'an, who began the Dawla al-Aghaliba in Tunis. When, he, uh, when they wanted to appoint uh, Sahnun as the Qadi, he refused. For one year this man argued with him. Finally the Sultan worked out a strategy. He brought him before him and he said, what do you say about a man who's the best of the Muslims and the ruler wants to appoint him as Qadi? What do you say about this man? He said he should be forced. What if he refuses? And he said then you should still force him until he accepts it. He said what if even forcing doesn't work? Then he should be whipped until he, he accepts it. And he said, Araka hadha rajal, you are this man. What do you want me to do? And this Sa'id ibn Jubair argued with him till finally he accepted the qada with three conditions. The first condition that he would begin with the, the family of the ruler and the ministers and all of the people working for the government. That that's who he would implement his qada first. And the second thing that he would not be given any money for his work. And the third thing that the implementation would take place immediately and he would either perform it with his own hand or witness it. And he accepted these conditions. Now this man, when Sahnun, when he became the Qadi of, 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 of uh, al qayrawan the people rejoiced because he brought justice to that city. One of the women who was accused of having a house where they were, uh, women were servicing men, what he did was he had the house destroyed and then he took that woman and he put her in a neighborhood surrounded by Salihin. He put her in a neighborhood surrounded by Salihin so that she could be rectified. This was Sahnun who was a model of success, a man who died in poverty, you see, so we don't measure our success by dunya. And the last thing uh, that I want to say is, I want to talk about uh, 10 qualities that have been identified as, uh, by these uh, kuffar. وَالْحِكْمَةُ طَالَّةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ the wisdom is the lost uh, beast of the of the the mu'min. And I want to say there are many women that I could use it as examples, and I think it's important uh, to mention uh, one of our most successful women, and that is Aisha radiallahu anha, one of the greatest intellectuals and scholars of this ummah, who was in the house of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, not wasting her time in frivolity, but learning and absorbing the knowledge of this deen to the point where all of the Sahaba recognized Aisha and went to her for guidance and for fatwa. And, and this, and Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, who is the model of a woman who, again, much is unknown of her life, but we know who she produced. Hassan wa Hussein, Shababa Ahl al Jannah, the two youth of the people of Jannah, and look at their lives, Hassan and Hussein. And this is a woman who her children are a testimony of who she is. And I will say, every single man that I mention behind him is their mother. 
Every single man of success in this, in this dunya and in akhira, behind that man is the mother or the murabbiya who raised uh, that man. And the women should recognize that, that we have countless women in the history of Islam whose names are unknown to us. But the works that they produced are in the children that they produced. The men and the women that they produced. And Madik ibn Anas, there is no Madik ibn Anas without Ummu Madik. There is no Madik ibn Anas without the mother of Madik, who when he went to study first, she, he said she used to tie the turban on my head. His mother used to tie the turban on his head. And she would take, uh, she would say to him, Khud min hilmi ibn Hormoz qabla an ta'khudha min albi. Take from his forbearance before you take from his knowledge. Because the woman knows the importance of forbearance. And the, the murdiya, the murabbiya of the Prophet is Halima, is the woman of Hilm. You see, these are the successful people. The, 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 the ten qualities that were identified, and I looked at each one of these and I recognized them as valuable, and that's the only reason that I'm repeating them, were identified by a neuro neuropsychologist uh, who studied people that were successful in this world. And we have to recognize that because we have left the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the models of success, the mentors of success, and the qualities and characteristics of success, we have become failures. And the people of dunya are ruling this world and they're creating havoc everywhere. And unless we return to the uh, examples of success, we will have no success. The first one is, they say every successful person has a strong sense of purpose. You have to have a strong sense of purpose. What greater sense of purpose than to know that your goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What greater sense of purpose than to know that your goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The second uh, most identifiable characteristic is they seek out role models or mentors. And these mentors instill in them a sense of possibility. This is the reason, according to the Quran, why the Prophet ﷺ was given the stories of the Prophets who went before him to give him tathbeet, to make first his heart that he would have success just as the prophets before him had success despite all the tribulation and so we have to look at the examples and the models of these early community and these great leaders because these are the people that instill in us a sense of possibility you were given success on the day of Badr and you were weak and, and abased in the earth the third identity is the strength of visualizing the goal the strength of visualizing the goal no one has a better visualization of his goal than the Messenger of Allah who I literally described to Suraqa ibn Malik the day that he would put on the bracelets of Kisra. The day that he would put on the bracelets of Kisra. And that happened when he stood before Umar ibn al-Khattab and the bracelets of Kisra were brought into the presence of Umar. And he said, the Prophet promised me that I would wear those bracelets. And Umar put them on Suraqa ibn Malik. And this is the sense that he instilled in them. He told them you would enter into the palaces of Qaisar and Kisra. And they had this sense on the day of the Khandaq when the Sahaba knew that he had proved that he was true. The Munafiqun said that he's only promised you delusion. So the Prophet was instilling them a sense. He was giving them a vision. He was giving them, he was putting in their mind's eye a sense of where they would be. And he even told them that there is coming a time when a woman will leave Sham and go to Yemen on her camel and fear nothing but the wolves in the road because there would be security and safety by the justice that Islam brought. He told them that they would enter into Jerusalem. He promised them that they would have victory in Constantine. He promised them that they would have promised us because it hasn't happened yet that we would have victory in Rome. That Rome would be conquered by the Muslims. That Constantine, which is now Istanbul, though it left Islam, will come back to Islam and it will come back to Islam without the sword. The Muslims will only come to the gates of it and say, Allahu Akbar! And the people will remember and return to Islam. And so this is the vision that the Prophet ﷺ instilled in his Sahaba. It's a vision not of failure but of success. We are people of success and this religion is a deen of success. It's not a deen of failure. And the Prophet was the most successful human being that ever lived on the face of the earth. And this is by the shahada of the non-Muslims. If you read Michael Hart, the historian who wrote the 100 most important personalities in history, he said the most successful human being that's ever lived is the messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And this is by the witness of our own enemies. And the greatest witness is what your own 
own enemies show testimony to. No one was more successful than the Messenger of Allah. And you have in him the best model because he is the model and the mentor of success. And if we follow him, we have success. And the fourth, uh, the fourth example is a positive sensory orientation that you dwell on past successes and not failures. We should not dwell on our failures. We should only remember the successes of this ummah. And this is why Allah reminds us, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرُكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمَ ذِلَّهُ Remember your past successes when you were weak and Allah gave you victory in the earth. And so we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us victory. And the next one is self-assurance. They know that they can succeed. They know that they can succeed. Do not be weak and do not grieve and you are the uppermost. If you were believers, if you were believers, and if you're afflicted by something, know that they're afflicted by it also. And your affliction is not their affliction because our affliction is a purification and a reward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their affliction is hasara, it's grief and despair and sorrow amongst them. Your qatra are in the hellfire and our qatra are in Jannah. Our dead are in Jannah. And the next thing, the sixth thing, I only have a few more, so I'm almost done. The next thing is that they plan and organize. They know how to prioritize. They break down their goals into workable parts. That we have to become people of what they call in the medical community triage. That they look at the most important thing and they take that. We have people now that, that uh, they spend their argumentation about where you put your hands in the prayer where your feet should be, where the, these things are known in the books of fiqh, we don't need to argument over them. You ask any uh, scholar of any worth and they'll tell you very clearly and there's different ways to do it because we're not supposed to get caught up in these trivial matters because this is the disease of the Talmudic rabbinical mind which asks what kind of cow, what color of cow, what they go into these and they say the devil's in the details even in this society, you see. Because this is what the pickiness, the picky-minded, narrow-minded, uh, simpleton people that spend their lives in trivial pursuit, in matters of no concern. No, we have greater things. This is a universal deen. The Prophet ﷺ is the universal man. The Prophet ﷺ is raising us above this triviality and putting us into the most important matters, which is where is your heart? On the day that nothing will benefit them, not wealth or anything, except the one who comes with a sound heart. And so where is the heart in the prayer? Not where is the feet, where is the heart? Where is your heart in the prayer? Where is the heart? What are you watching? I knew a man recently who wouldn't pray behind a man because he saw six mistakes in his prayer. And I wanted to know, who are you watching? Your brother or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who are you in muraqaba of? Who's your uh, muraqaba for? What is your prayer for? You're sitting there watching the imam to see how many uh, mistakes that he makes in moving his finger? I mean, subhanallah. These are diseases. And so we have to plan and organize. And organization, this is the only reason the corporations are successful, is because they know how to plan and organize. They plan way ahead of time. We can't even plan for tomorrow. The only thing I think now we've become good at planning is what we're going to eat for the next meal. People are very good at that. And we're good at walimas. And I think if I was Khalifa, and you're lucky I'm not, but if I was Khalifa, I'd banish all of these walimas. I'd finish it off. We have m women being raped all over the place. We have Muslims being bombed. We have uh, uh, our mosques being destroyed. And we're busy, uh, how many sheep are going to be there? And how many belly dancers at that wedding? I heard of a wedding not too long ago that had nine belly dancers. Allahu Akbar, takbir. Do you know what kind of takbir? Takbiratul janaza, the funeral prayer. That's what kind of takbir, four of them. So here, the next one is the ability to acquire necessary skills needed to succeed. And that means you have to identify where your weaknesses are. And one of our greatest weaknesses is we don't have scholars, neither from the men or the women. And we need to produce scholars that can guide our ummah. And everybody wants their child to be an engineer or a doctor. Why don't you want your child to be what the greatest thing that a human being can be? A da'yan illallahi, a bashir al nadira. Why don't you want to be from amongst the people that the Prophet said, the two parents of the one who memorizes the book of Allah will be given crowns of light on the Yom Qiyamah. Why don't we want to be from those people? Why don't we want to be from the people where your children, waladun salih, yad'u lahu, 
a righteous child who, who invokes Allah for them because their dunya won't help you. Their dunya won't help you. Your provision was written before you were born. Their dunya is not going to help you, but their akhirah will help you. So make your children people of akhirah, not people of dunya. And then the next is they patience, sabr. وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُ وَصَابِرُ Be patient and enjoin others to patience. And I tell you, there are two lessons as far as I'm concerned that the Muslims have to learn. Because all of the tribulations coming to us are based on two things as far as I'm concerned. One is kibr and the other is, is the lack of patience. Kibr and the lack of patience. Until we get kibr out of our hearts and recognize that saying La ilaha illallah does not make you special because the munafiq says La ilaha illallah and he's lower than the kafir. He's lower than the kafir. And if you feel safe from nifaq, from hypocrisy, according to Hassan al-Basri, one of the greatest of the tabi'in, you're a munafiq. لا يأمن من النفاق إلا منافق. The only one that feels safe from nifaq is the munafiq. So if you feel safe from nifaq, because Umar ibn al-Khattab didn't feel safe from nifaq, he went to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman and said, "Atarafiya ma tarafihim? Do you see in those munafiqin what you do? You see in me what you see in them? Unshiduka billah. Tell me by Allah. I want to know if Umar is a munafiq." And he said, oh, I don't see in you what I see in them. So you have to ask yourself, and if you want the qualities of the munafiqun, it's in the Quran. They say on their tongues what's not in their hearts. They pray lazily. They don't remember Allah except a little bit. They're mutadabdib, they oscillate. You see, they're all there. You can find them in there. So you, we have to have patience, perseverance. And, and then perseverance. خَيْرُ الْعَمَارِ أَدْوَامُهَا وَنْقَلَّ Be persevering. لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى No one has except what they endeavor for, what they persevere for. وَأَنَّ سَعْيُهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى And he will see his endeavor. He will see his endeavor. We will see our سَعِي وَكَانَ سَعْيُهُ مَشْكُورَ And their endeavor was, uh, was uh, shown with gratitude by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. سَعْيًا مَشْكُورًا وَذَنْبًا مَغْفُورًا وَتِجَارَةً لَنْ تَبُورًا A سَعِي, an endeavor that Allah shows gratitude to and Allah is shakur. And then the last thing is the ability to love what one is doing. To love what one is doing. Allahu Akbar. We have to love what we're doing. Radiallahu anhum wa radu anhu. They love uh, Allah and Allah loves them. They're pleased with Allah and Allah's pleased with them. And none of you truly believes until he loves uh, Allah and His Messenger more than he loves his own self. And so working for Allah and His Messenger would be the most beloved thing to him because he loves Allah and His Messenger. So this is the last thing, you have to love what you're doing. And if you find it difficult, They only give out infaq and they hate it, they detest it. So we have to start giving out and loving it, spending our money and loving it. You don't reach bir righteousness until you give out what you love. What you love. So we have to love to give out. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakum Allah khair.